I was so sick sitting there that at that point I was weighing out the options of the side effects. Um, I was so concerned about not being able to have another baby. Um, I was so concerned about, um, you know, just the radiation aspect of that. Um, however, after hearing the side effects of this clinical trial, it kind of, to me, I just said, you know, why wouldn't I try this? My name is Allison Rosen. I am a stage two colorectal cancer survivor and very, very passionate advocate. I've worked in the field of oncology for about 17 years and went through colorectal cancer 10 years ago and um, have been an advocate ever since I was in remission. We want to humanize colorectal cancer clinical trials by hearing from people who have been through them and are now dedicated to advocate for others. And we're also going to answer facts, questions, break myths that surround clinical trials in general, but especially colorectal cancer um, clinical trials. Um, next, we have our first um, CRC advocate, Kelly Spill. And uh, Kelly is joined by an amazing special guest. Yes, I have Maya here. I'm Kelly. And I was diagnosed at age 28 with stage three colorectal cancer. At that time, I had an ulcerated five centimeter uh, tumor and I received nine infusions of immunotherapy from March to August, 2020. And then I was declared in remission um, that same August. Hi everyone, um, I am Julie Clower. I am a stage four colorectal cancer patient. I was diagnosed stage four in March of 2018 um, with uh, liver mets. And since then I've had cancer jump throughout uh, pretty much everywhere, the lung, liver, uh, lymph nodes, bone, everywhere. So I've had active disease the whole five years um, and started participating in a clinical trial in July of 2020 and was on it for two and a half years and it completely changed the trajectory of my disease. And I might actually in two weeks have my first no evidence of disease scans. So we're, we're hoping that after all these years, I'm finally knit. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Zersik. I'm a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and I'm um, obviously very passionate about uh, clinical trials and, you know, the, the hope for the future that, that they give us. So I'm excited to be here today. So we're going to start with Kelly. Um, we want to hear more about your clinical trial experience. Um, after your diagnosis, um, what were your first treatment options and, and how did you end up hearing about clinical trials? Did your doctor actually bring this up? Did you bring it up? Yeah, so um, my original treatment option was chemo and then chemo and radiation, and then surgery, um, which would have led me to um, having a colostomy bag for the rest of my life, and also most likely not being able to carry another baby again. Um, I didn't know anything about clinical trials to, prior to this at all. Um, I'm actually still learning to this day, and it's very exciting to learn now that I'm in remission. So um, I'm in a big, big learning era right now. Um, but I thankfully had a research nurse um, come into my, my room right before we we're about to make an appointment for to start chemo. And um, I was at the time going to Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I do want to say if I didn't go there, um, I would have never known about this clinical trial. Um, it was my first stop shop. I was planning on checking out a couple cancer centers at the time. And once I hit Sloan, I felt like I was at home. I felt like a family member there. I felt very comfortable. Um, and they were very informative with everything that was going on and that I needed to know. So um, thankfully I had a research trial, uh, research nurse come in and she basically said, you know, we may have another option for you. Do you want to, would you like to hear it? And I said, you know, of course I want to hear another option. Yeah. Um, and I had this other option specifically because my tumor type, um, was an MMRD, so it was a mismatch repair deficient. Um, so it allowed me to be on this clinical trial. And um, I weighed out my options. I had my mom with me and I don't know what I would do without her. It was really nice having someone with me that was able to understand what I was being told, um, being so sick and not feeling well and just being young. I had no idea what a lot of these big words meant and um, really what was going on at the time. So. 
um, after I heard the pros and cons of the, the side effects, really, um, I looked at my mom and I said, you know, should we, should we do this? And she said, how do you feel about it? And basically mom was like, listen, you're pretty much like, you're going to be like a rat right now. You're a rat in, uh, a, um, you know, trying to figure out if this is going to work or not. And I said, you know what? I have nothing to lose. The side effects sound a lot less, um, you know, worse than chemo and radiation and surgery, you know, let's just, let's give it a shot. And if that didn't work for me, then we would have went back and did the chemo and chemo radiation and surgery. So I still had that backup option of doing that. Um, but that was my, my beginnings of my story. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and, um, letting everyone know how you came to that decision because it's it's personal and hearing different different um viewpoints is so important for others listening because I'm I'm going to guess that a lot of people listening are are thinking about trials or are in trials right now so um Dr. Sersik I want to ask um you a question so you co-led the trial that Kelly was on um and know her well can you quickly tell us a little bit more about this trial yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as, as Kelly mentioned, so the study is still open. It's for patients with mismatch repair deficiency, so specific subtype or genetic change um, in early stage rectal cancer. So normally for early stage rectal cancer, the treatment, as Kelly mentioned, is chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And because it's located down in the pelvis at the end of the large intestine, there's a lot of important organs there that are affected by our normal treatment, like with radiation, the ovaries, the uterus. Um, and so people, although it's a good treatment and it's curative, people are left with a lot of toxicity from treatment, including not being able to have babies, bowel bladder dysfunction, uh, and potentially even a permanent bag in, in, in you know, about a third of patients or so because of where the tumors are. So the idea of the study was to, in this subset of patients with mismatch repair deficient or what are called MSI high tumors to try immunotherapy. And we knew that in advanced disease in, in stage four disease, um, immunotherapy works very well for mismatch repair deficient colon and rectal cancers. And patients were cured that were previously told best supportive care, no other treatment options. And so it just, it worked very well in stage four disease. It was approved. And then the trial, our trial, was specifically asking the question, well, can, can it work even better when the tumor is early stage, when it's localized before it spreads? And the way that, um, you know, we designed it, as Kelly mentioned, is that because the normal, the standard treatment was curative and, and was, you know, meant to cure patients, we didn't want to obviously compromise cure. So we gave immunotherapy first, watched the patients really closely. And then if the tumor um, didn't completely go away, they would simply jump onto the normal standard of care regimen with chemotherapy, chemo radiation, and surgery, um, uh, you know, depending on the, on the clinical situation, but everyone would be offered kind of the complete package. Um, but thankfully, as with Kelly, uh, we saw that Im immunotherapy alone really is able to get rid of these tumors. So it's been, um, it's been really amazing. And now we're treating all different early stage cancers, including esophagus and stomach that have this specific genetic change, this mismatch repair deficiency or, or MSI high. And, and as I mentioned, the rectal study is still ongoing. Kelly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to you for a second and sort of ask, um, what was the process like for you before deciding to join the trial? Did you have any concerns? Like what were some of the questions that you asked your doctor? And I know you brought some of this up, but is there anything else you don't wanna share about that? I was so sick sitting there that at that point, I was weighing out the options of the side effects. Um, I was so concerned about not being able to have another baby. Um, I was so concerned about, um, you know, just the radiation aspect of that. I remember sitting and listening to what I would have experienced with that, with those side effects. My sex life would have never been the same um, and all that. It really scared me on really the radiation part scared me and the surgery part scared me a lot more than the chemo aspect of, at that time. Um, however, after hearing the side effects of this clinical trial, it kind of, to me, I just said, you know, why wouldn't I try this? Um, especially knowing that I did have the backup plan of being able to go on that chemo and go on that radiation surgery plan. 
Um, and I just, my mom and I just told each other, I was like, let's go for it. Um, I haven't had experience with a lot of people in my family having cancer. I'm the only one in my family who had, who has been diagnosed with colorectal cancer and really there's no one in my family who has cancer. So I, um, I haven't been surrounded around it. I didn't know anything. Um, so it was more of a chance in, in our eyes, just, you know, should we do it? Should we not? And, um, now that I'm coming out of this, I want to be that advocate for this so much because so many young people are being diagnosed with colorectal cancer and at this age, and if you don't know anyone who goes through it, you don't even know that there's even any of these options, any of these resources or anything like that. So um, that's, that's mainly why I'm here too, is just because of the young aspect of just not knowing. Yeah. And, and I think that it's important to note that that trial was for that specific gene, but there, are, and I know later we're going to talk about sort of some what's going on right now. Um, are there any other trials, but um, it's important to know that. And it's important to know your genes and your mutations and, and, and all that so that you can figure out what, what trial works best for you. So obviously talk to your doctor about that just to, so you have that, that knowledge. So um, thank you for, for sharing. Um, I've listened to you speak. I've heard about your research and, and now meeting Kelly and seeing you know, the human side of it. It's just amazing. And um, so thank you. Thank you so, so much for doing what you're doing and continue doing what you're doing. Thank you. Um, of course, of course. Um, so next we're gonna move on to Julie. Um, and Julie, we wanna hear a little bit more about you and your clinical, clinical trial experience and, and how did you learn about it? And um, how much did you know before? And sort of what are you doing as far as a trial, but you know, um, to help others now? So clinical trials, it's interesting because I, in my first doing appointment before um, I started treatment, I was told about a clinical trial. So it kind of like, I thought that was just what happens is you get offered, you know, clinical trials all the time. That's just how it works. So I, and I, I found out later that that's not actually how it works. So, so because that was kind of my intro to um, clinical trials, I just thought that that's kind of again, how, how the system went. So at that time, I decided not to do the clinical trial. Um, but then every time kind of I was in, you know, in treatment, I knew with stage four and as, as extensive as the disease I had, I knew that probably the first line of treatment wasn't going to work forever. And, you know, and I knew that, that this wasn't going to be a one shot deal for me. So I, I'm a planner by nature. And so I just wanted to know what the options were before I needed them. And so, so that really, like, you know, in terms of learning, it was actually when I was on on a treatment, it was going well, you know, we're moving along that I was actually actually did the most looking at clinical trials. And I felt like that was extremely helpful to me because um, you're not in a panic state, you're really looking at it very objectively, you're not, you know, you're not, you're not making a kind of a, a major life decision at that point. It's kind of like browsing for a house when you don't need to buy one, right? Is, is it's just, it's a little more kind of fun and natural. And so every time I'd go into my oncologist, sometimes I'd find out about clinical trials from colon town. I'd, you know, hear about something from, you know, from, from another patient or my doctor would tell me about something he was working on that was really exciting. And so, you know, we kind of dribbled the clinical trial conversation in where I'd bring something on an appointment and just say, Hey, you know, I heard about this trial. What do you think? And just get his opinion. And so it, you know, it, it kind of was like, talking about clinical trials and learning about clinical trials two minutes at a time over a long period of time. So anytime I got, you know, news of progression and I needed a treatment change, um, you know, we'd, we'd already kind of have a set of what would be next. So I always wanted to have a few options. So um, the, the clinical trial I ended up going on was kind of always in that short list. And it was like, okay, we can go to the second line or we can do this trial or we can, you know, do et cetera, or, or go do surgery. And so we kind of already had that list. So when I when I would come in with, you know, the results of a scan that wasn't good, we'd say, okay, now given what we see now, are all those still options? And how do we want to move forward? And so we kind of had already made the decision before I needed the decision. Um, so this trial was one that was kind of on the docket for a long time. And so I actually learned a lot about it. I learned how the early results were going. I learned, you know, I learned probably almost too much about it because by the time it was time to go on it, it actually, the trial was not looking very good in terms of the results. Um, so from a from a research perspective, it didn't meet its end point. It was not good, not a good trial in, as it turns out. And at the time it looked like it was going in that direction. Um, but I had progression and I also was really exhausted. I had, you know, I'd had over 60 
chemo treatments. I had over five open surgeries. I had multiple radiation. My body was just worn out. And so when it came time to decide what was next, I could have, I could have gone on a, um, the, the last line of, of, um, standard care, um, chemotherapy, um, uh, the th a third line treatment that was available, or I had two trials that were in my mix. So those were kind of my three at the time that were citing. So trial number one, trial number two, and then, and then, and then, um, the standard of care. And when I went in to my doctor, we were talking about the, the trial that, that I ended up going on and it was a better option than the standard of care option at the time for me. Um, but we talked about the fact that it wasn't going to probably change the change the trajectory of my disease i wasn't going to be cured from it that wasn't how it was looking but the kind of short term stability was pretty good on it and so i was you know he said to me he said you know you could have a chemo break it was immunotherapy based he's like the the toxicity is less it could give you a few months to regroup have a chemo break kind of and kind of hopefully get you to stability so we could figure out what's next so it really was intended to kind of be a bridge but I said, okay, I think I want to do this, but that you have that other trial that I'm more interested in. So I want to go talk to that PI. So he was at a different institution. I made an appointment with him, talked to him about the trial, was excited about it. And he said, but it's not open for another six weeks. And when I look at your counts, you're not going to be able to wait that long. So there's also an element of, you know, you have to kind of have options because you just don't know what will be available and what will work for you. So I said, okay, well, that's not an option. So I'm going to go, go with number two. And again, I just was looking for kind of a range of stability and it ended up, I ended up on it stable for two and a half years. It opened up like a lot, you know, I, I was able to get surgery. I was actually, it, it, it was, it was much better than stable in my opinion, in terms of the actual results for the trial, it was stable. But I think it just goes to show that like, you have to know what you're looking for um, and also have some options. And, and I really think making that decision without like having the panic of trying to learn everything about it at that moment, because those moments are really scary. And, you know, having, having somebody else who can help talk you through it is fantastic, but also not having to have all that thrown at you at a time when you're really, really scared and trying to figure out the logistics and everything while you're in that moment, I think was, was key for me. So my clinical trial experience is, was fantastic. It well out delivered for what I, what I, what I wanted. Um, I was able to then, you know, I actually went off the trial to get surgery, which wasn't an option before I went on the trial. Um, my side effects were significantly better. And then I also, since then, have gone on another treatment that's off-label because of how I responded on the trial. It was something that that kind of became an option because of how, how that trial did for me. So it really changed everything about my disease, but it definitely was not the, okay, we're, we're looking for a cure at this time. So, so technically on a clinical trial, if you have between 30% shrinkage and 20% growth on certain, certain tumors, um, that they're measuring for the trial, that means stability. So technically I had stability. However, I had 29.4% shrinkage. And so I was right on the cusp and, um, I had 11 mets and it went down to four. I was non-surgical, went to surgical. So, you know, in terms of, in those outcomes, that's why like it's very, those outcomes are so important for researchers to look at and to see the whole population and how, you know, how they, how, how people do to be able to move, move the science forward and medicine forward. But when you're an individual patient, what all that matters is what it means to you, I think. Thank you so much for answering that and sharing this. Um, and, and Kelly, I want to jump to you for a sec, because you mentioned earlier, again, your mom was a part of your decision making and, and you now strive to, to be an advocate to help others. And you are um, an advocate. And first of all, by sharing here, but I know you you do other work sharing and um, what what do you want what advice do you have for people as far as being their own best advocate when it when you know you're talking to your care team um, how did you make sure did you keep a diary of your side effects like how do you inform your team if if something might not be quite right um, what advice do you have for someone that might be going through a trial right now yeah so I was before I started the trial, I was taking pictures of what was happening in the bathroom um, because sometimes it's hard for me to describe what's going on. And so taking pictures, showing my showing my oncologist was um, something that I was doing. Um, I was very, I ended up being very close to my oncologist, my research nurse. They, they were calling me when 
pretty much like all the time. Hey, are you okay? What's going on? How are you feeling? We were pretty much in like a best friend basis. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that's how it is in every hospital, but I, I was taken care of very closely and um, I was, we had a very open communication. I wasn't holding anything back. I told him how I was feeling um, after the first treatment, the second treatment, the third treatment, you know, every little detail, um, even not, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, the whole everything, because all of that plays, uh, plays into it. Um, and then as a, as a mom as well, you know, your mind is, is elsewhere during the time, during days too. So I was writing down in my notes on my iPhone, um, how I was feeling at home. Um, you know, I was also constipated a lot, not doing well. I remember after my, my, I think it was my first or second treatment, I was going to the bathroom and it was, this was definitely TMI, but we're here for in this, in the space for it. But I couldn't stop going to the bathroom. It was the complete opposite problem that I had been having. And I was like, oh my God, this can't be happening. Is this, is this supposed to be happening? What's going on? I quickly called the research nurse, told her what was going on. And she said, that's actually, that's great news. You know, everything is being released. Um, so it's just, you know, staying in contact, being honest, what's going on, being honest with yourself. Um, and if you have a question, ask it, don't be scared. I know it's easy to be scared when you're going through something like that but you know just putting everything out on the table is so 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 important for you and for research as well ask questions be open um, you know your body best you know yourself best coming from someone who's a big introvert i always feel like i'm annoying people with all these questions it's so important to ask them and um yeah trust your gut big, that, that's big for me too is trust your gut thank you and we'll end with um julie what is your one piece of advice I'd say that uh, there's no perfect trial for everybody, right? They're, they're all studies, they're all trying to learn. So really knowing yourself and trying to kind of have those conversations, understand what you're willing to do, are you willing to travel, all that stuff before you need to make the decision. Because when you get to that point of having to make the decision, you don't have enough time necessarily to make a, the best decision you can.